Well, hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Scientology Fair Game. I think I got that right, right, Mike? <laughs> yep, you got it right this week. <laughs> so you <laughs> Anyway, once again, we have a guest that we just love and admire, Paulette Cooper. Thank you so much for joining us this week, Paulette. It's such an honor and a pleasure to have you to talk to us. You, in my mind, are the the OG of Fair Game Victims. You are the original and the... You're a woman who survived something that I think is absolutely remarkable, not just your life vis-a-vis -vis Scientology, but your life before Scientology. And, right. you know, your whole story is just incredible. And it's, it's such always such a pleasure to be able to talk to you. And let's get going here. I, I'm just fascinated by you and your strength and your courage. And you continue to talk, which is not usual for somebody, you're, you were never a Scientologist, and I'm going to let you tell your story. So let's go back, Paulette. Hi, my name is Paulette Cooper. <laughs> and hi, Paulette. <laughs> hi there. <laughs> and I was born in Belgium during the war, mm -hmm. and I am Jewish, and my father was taken and killed in Auschwitz, and right after I was born, my mother was taken, and she was killed in Auschwitz. And actually, I have a, a blood sister, and the two of us were also supposed to be uh, taken to Auschwitz and killed. And one week before, we were saved. And how actually I can thank my fight against Scientology for that. Why? Because I did not know how I was saved. Mm -hmm. And what happened was that there was a news story about me. Mm -hmm. Fighting Scientology. And this was just a few years ago. And it mentioned that I was born in, and she was written by, the story was written by Tony Ortega. Mm -hmm. And it mentioned that I was born in Belgium. So the story got picked up by the Belgian newspapers mm -hmm. and the sister Dutch paper. And within 24 hours after the story about my fighting Scientology and what they did to me as a result, I got an email from a man in Holland saying, I think it was my father who saved you. <laughs> and he had various, you know, he said various things in his email that he could not have known right. if he had not known my real family. Okay. And it turned out that this man and my blood father, that's my father who was killed, yeah. had been best friends. And this man became the one who's, you know, father saved me, uh -huh. he became a very high ranking Dutch official. Mm -hmm. And he bribed the camp that I was in, the Nazi camp that I was in, yeah. he bribed them to release my sister and me. And the transport to Auschwitz that I was supposed to be on carried 1,554 people and not my sister and me. Wow. And we ended up in a series of orphanages until I was six years old, at which point I was lucky enough to be adopted by a wonderful family, the Coopers, and I became an American citizen. And I went to college. I got a master's degree in psychology. And I also studied comparative religion at mm -hmm. Harvard one summer. So I was already interested in this area. Right. After I got my master's and I moved to New York, Scientology was very, very popular. Mm -hmm. And probably then they had maybe about 150,000 members, mm. between 100 and 150. Now, happily, it's down to under 20. And let's see it go even lower than that. Uh, and what so years? What years are we talking about? This is about? nineteen six. We're talking about okay. nineteen sixty-eight. Yeah, yeah. And okay. Was, yeah, and it was very yeah. popular, as I said, mm -hmm. in those days. And I, I went to work as an advertising copywriter, and I had a boyfriend who joined Scientology, and then he said to me that he had learned that he was Jesus Christ in a past life, and basically, <laughs> that led me to. 
start to want to look into what was going on. Because right, because this really was a was strange. This, right, because this was a friend of yours, right? And then all of a sudden, he's, oh yeah, he was a, he's, he was he's a, a boyfriend, right? Oh yeah, he, so he you know him, and now all of a sudden, this person is right. talking crazy. Yeah, exactly. Right. So any right. concerned girlfriend would be like, <laughs> "What's going on?" <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, and and yeah, so at that point, uh, I was just starting to be a writer. Mm. And I thought, well, you know, this might be something worth investigating. Right. And little did I realize what I was taking on at that right. point. Right. I should have probably because as very soon after I, I first wrote an article that appeared in England and I began getting death threats. Mm. But after I, the, art, the, after the article, the article was about appeared. it was about Scientology. Yeah. In fact, mm-hmm. the funny thing, the odd thing is that I didn't even know the article had come out yet in right. England. And right. suddenly I was getting death threats, and then I found out that the article had appeared. Right. And I began doing more and more research. In those days, investigative reporting was a hot subject, and I had enough material for a book. And there had been no major exposés of Scientology up to that point. Right. And I decided to write this book called The Scandal of Scientology, which sometimes I jokingly refer to now as the book that launched a thousand suits. Right. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> all against me. <laughs> right, right. And right. And the Scientologists did mm. everything they could to silence me. And they started this, you know, what we call fair game, the fair game right. process. Exactly. Of exactly. trying to destroy you. So the death That's rats, right. all of this is part of the fair game directive, right, Mike? Yes. You know, death threats seem like an odd thing to stop someone other than this is the we want you to be so scared and intimidated that you back off and you become a dismissed attacker and you are no longer willing to open your mouth and say anything about us and what were the authorities saying at this point paulette when you were showing them the death threats were they willing to deal with it or they just didn't know what to do with it no, the people thought that this was just a nice little group. Like the, nobody really understood what a cult was at all yeah, until and they, Jonestown, and that right. was what 1975. Right. Until then, a cult was that, that was people who listened to songs of Judy Garland. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. So they were like, "This is a church that they would never right. do this." Right. Okay. Right. They, yeah. If you had to decide which one was crazy, it was going to be they would decide it would be me. Interesting. Right. Okay. So you wrote the book. I wrote the book. Scientology. Yes. Oh, right. It's called The (laughs) Scandal of Scientology. Right. And by the way, I have made it available on my website at paulacooper.com. Anyone who wants to read it for free can. Right. Right. Thank you. Yeah. So anyway, all these things began happening and it was just, it got really, really very bad. There were death threats. We found that my phone had been tapped. They were putting my name and phone number up on bathroom walls in the city. So men were calling me with these terrible, obscene calls. Mm -hmm. Everywhere I went, they were following me. But, you know, this uh, what what Scientology calls, I believe, noisy investigations. It's not as if they were trying to be quiet and that I wouldn't know. Right. Mike, do you want to explain? You want to explain what noisy investigations are, Mike? Yeah, it's the it's exactly the same thing as I was talking about before. This is mm-hmm. the we are going to intimidate you into silence. Mm-hmm. We are going to have private investigators overtly and very obviously following you with cameras in your faces. We are going to do things to you which are intended to intimidate you and make you decide this isn't worth the the hassle. This isn't worth the heartache. I'm just not going to carry on with this because it's just, you know, what have I got to gain out of this? And but I just, know, I just want works. people to know at home, though, that, that or in your car, wherever you are, <laughs> that that this is actual policy. It's actually these words are used: a noisy investigation. And Mike, you should put it up on your blog, and we'll have yep. Paulette's links up as well, where you could read her book for free. And also, Tony Ortega wrote. A story uh, wrote a book, right? Tony Ortega with uh, with Paulette, with, with, with Paulette called "The Unbreakable Miss Lovely," and we'll explain that later. But that this will all be up on the blog for you guys to to look at. One day, 
there was a delivery for me. Mm -hmm. And when there were flowers and I was not there, my roommate was there. She was Mm -hmm. my cousin. Actually, she looked like me. She was, you know, a short brunette. Mm -hmm. And when she opened the door, the guy unwrapped the flowers and there was a gun in there. And he put the gun to her head and either the gun misfired or it was empty. No one knows. She began screaming. Neighbors opened up the door and the guy ran off. And that was very scary because I didn't know whether it was a murder attempt, whether it was to scare me. Uh, Mike and you can talk about something called R245, which Mm -hmm. is what I think it was, because one woman who has since left Scientology wrote an affidavit saying that during this period of time, she was at a meeting in which they were discussing using R245 against Paula Cooper. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about R245? Yeah, very much, Paulette, and particularly because there is a specific issue by L. Ron Hubbard in his own hand that says that if certain people are seen, Sea Org members are to employ R245 on them. And R245 is the name that Hubbard gave, I want to say a joke, but it's not like it's a funny joke, as sort of a, a nod and a wink of this is a Scientology process, quote unquote, that will result in exteriorization, which in in Hubbard's terminology is the spirit departing from the body and and operating outside the body. Well, it means death. It means death. Yeah. Exteriorization doesn't mean death, but R245 means... You are going yeah. to exterior, he called an exteriorization process, instant exteriorization, put a bullet in someone's head and they are instantly exteriorized from their body. They are no longer there. In other words, they're dead. So R245 is a thing that is a shorthand use in Scientology for shooting someone in the head. Right. And Mike. Nothing about L. Ron Hubbard or Scientology is a joke. Everything that is put in writing from L. Ron Hubbard is followed to the T. There's no wink-wink in the reference to R45. There, It's still in print. People are still seeing that. But certainly back, things have changed, Mike, wouldn't you say? I mean, back then they were doing these types of things, going this far. L. Ron Hubbard was still alive, but it's still there. It's still in writing. Fair game is still alive and well. And uh, Scientology, I believe, tried to put out a statement once when I think, did Tony Ortega write about it? Or somebody, somebody in the press wrote about it and Scientology, I think, responded with, oh, that was just a joke. And if you know Scientology policy, there's nothing about Scientology that's a joke. As a matter of fact, there's a policy called jokers and degraders. And it's almost illegal in Scientology to be making jokes about Scientology in any way. I know because I've been uh, reprimanded for it many times. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Paulette, was this man ever found? Was any investigation opened? Nobody knew anything that was going on on it, except I will say that I was very, very frightened. Of course. And I decided to move almost immediately to a doorman building, okay. much safer building. Mm-hmm. And I moved in, thought I was safe. And all of the tenants in the building, all 300 of them, received an anonymous mimeographed smear letter saying that I had moved in there, that I was a part-time prostitute with venereal disease who had sexually molested a two-year-old baby girl. Mm. It was so weird. Now, maybe Mike would like to discuss this whole thing about molestation of children and how that often comes up in Scientology. This is pursuant to the exact ideas laid out in the policy of you find things that are buttons. You find things that people find reprehensible, that people find 
touchy as subjects and you start accusing the person who you are seeking to silence of those things. And as right. Paulette says, the history of Scientology and its dealing with sexual molestation and the molestation of children is abhorrent. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is founded in the beliefs that Hubbard had about children and what children are and how they react and how to deal with in law enforcement and et cetera, et cetera. So you often see the accusations against people who Scientology is seeking to silence being the very things that Scientology is most guilty of. Mm -hmm. They accuse people <clears throat> of lying. They accuse people of being sex offenders. They accuse people of abusing other people, of physical violence. So, yeah, you're right, Paulette. That's exactly how it goes. I mean, that's why I said you are the poster child for fair game <laughs> because you're, everything that happened to you is pursuant to the policies that are laid out and those policies still exist. And so they are still being done. Well, what happened next after that is almost immediately after I moved, I received a visit from two FBI agents and I was called before a grand jury. And I was told that Scientology claimed to have received two bomb threats and that they named me as a likely suspect. Well, the whole concept was ridiculous. I didn't even take it seriously until I found out that the, one of the bomb threats had my fingerprint on it mm. and that I faced 15 years in jail for sending bomb threats through the mail. Mm -hmm. And this was a very, very terrible time for me. Even now, I don't like to remember it. Of course. For eight months, I had 15 years in jail over my head. I was in danger of, it was going to become a big news story, and I was just going to be absolutely ruined, totally humiliated. I, I would embarrass my adopted parents, which I didn't want to do. Right. And there was nothing I could do. I was not believed when I said I didn't do it, that they did it to me. They had come into the grand jury with their black clerical robes and a huge crosses. And the jurors had to decide who's telling the truth. These nice religious people right. who claim that they're being harassed by this writer mm -hmm. or a writer who at 30 is, is not married, is doing travel writing, so traveling around the world mm -hmm. alone. And uh, they decided that I was the one who must have done it. And I was indicted on May 9th, 1973. I was arrested on May 19th, 1973. And the man I had planned to marry left me because I went into such a terrible depression right. that I could not eat. I went down to 83 pounds. Wow. I was living on one hard-boiled egg and a glass of tomato juice and lots and lots of vodka and Valium right. for eight months. I was just a total wreck. I couldn't even leave my apartment during that time. And I had a dog to walk. And I met this guy who had moved into my building. And he offered to walk the dogs and the dogs, I had one, and to help out. And then I could no longer work. I could no longer write. So he suggested that he move into my place and he could take care of things and he could um, uh, walk the dog and pay half the rent. And I said, okay. I mean, I was so depressed. It was good, actually. Course, it's yeah. in its own strange way to have somebody there. Right. And one of the things that has always really, really upset me is that uh, there was a, a pool up on the roof of my building. And most of the time he would go up there. I later found out that he was using the payphone, 
but he got me to go up a couple of times with him. And on one occasion, he jumped up on the ledge. He was a very gutsy guy. He had been a helicopter pilot in Vietnam. He jumped up on the ledge and he said, come on, you got to come up here and show those bastards how strong you are and that you're not afraid of anything so that you can face the jurors for this trial. Come on. And thank God I was afraid of heights and I was in such a state that I just sat on the chair, huddled and cried. I couldn't get up there. And when five years later, I found out that he was a Scientologist, that he was calling in a diary every day on what I was doing, what the lawyers were doing, what I was wearing so I could be followed on those days that I had to go out and writing things. Here's this guy who was my, quote, best friend saying, today she's talking about suicide. Wouldn't that be great for Scientology? And I do believe that the oh, his plan was to get me up there. And mm-hmm. I was in such a suicidal state at that point that it would have been tremendously easy for him to just touch me and push me over. And right. everyone would have thought that I commit suicide and Scientology would have been rid of their worst. And at that point, only enemy. Right, right. I don't even have the, I mean, I've heard the story, Paulette. I've read your book. I've read Tony's book. It's still, I mean, I'm just still in just kind of utter shock, Mike. I mean, it's, it's, if something, I, I, if <laughs> something had changed, right? It, you listen to these stories for 15 years, they're abusing her, they're destroying her life, they're doing everything that Fair Game says to do, they're attempted murder on, on several occasions here. If, Something, if we were just talking about history, there would be somewhat of a, well, at least, but we can't even say that. That's absolutely right. This is history that is being repeated. Today. Repeated over and over, today Mm -hmm. and every other day. And I sit here and I listen to Paulette and it's like, I have these lumps in my throat of right. I can't actually think of what the appropriate thing Response. to say is. Right, right. And and you know, uh, I that's why I started out this saying, Paulette, I have so much respect for you. It's not funny. It's like what you survived and how you came through this and that you persisted and persevered is absolutely astonishing. Yes. And I take strength from mm-hmm. knowing your story to keep going no matter what. And I think a lot of other people do too. And, mm-hmm. you know, we're not even to the end of it yet. Yeah. We have not been indicted and facing criminal charges w- with 15 years in prison. Yes. And losing everything, trusting people to come into your home to think that you have a best friend only to find out that he's a plant to, you know, it, it's, it's just, uh, anyway. And, and I just want to remind you of it still happening today. Well, I had this over my head for eight months and yeah. it was, it was just horrendous. And in the end, we were able to get a little bit of information against them to uh-huh. at least be able to show the prosecutor that these were not necessarily nice people. Yeah. And, that helped. The government then began, they didn't really, they didn't want to lose the case and they weren't sure anymore. So at that point, they made an offer that they would drop the case. They didn't drop the case. For That's right. For a year, I had it over my head that at any moment I could just be rearrested. Right. And, um, but I'm going to fast forward four years and I had this over my head. And by the way, during this time and afterwards, they kept suing me. They even sued me for somebody somebody else's book. <laughs> uh, they said, "Yeah, they said I'd helped him. I didn't at all." Um, even they, if you they, did, but even right, if you did, I, mean, I know. But yeah. they just kept they kept suing me and suing me, mm-hmm. and I had ended up with nineteen lawsuits, and I had to fight every one of them, and they were all over the world. So that was tremendously and, and, and pay for it. depressing. Yeah, and yeah, pay and for, pay it. for I mean, it. It was so depressing. The whole the. To this day, I can't walk into a lawyer's office without having an anxiety attack. Right, but of course. But anyway, so four years later, 
the FBI seized Scientology's papers. And that was something called Snow White. When that was, uh, uh, do you want to talk about how? Yeah. So what, what, so what started this, Mike? What started the F? Because it wasn't Paulette. It was something completely unrelated to Paulette, right? Right. It began with a Scientology had sent spies into government agencies. The and this IRS, is in the 70s, right? Right. In the okay. 70s, the IRS, the FBI, the Department of Justice, or I mean, dozens and dozens of government agencies, and they were stealing documents and planting documents and gathering intelligence information and smearing people, et cetera, et cetera. And eventually one of them got caught with a fake ID. Mm -hmm. And that guy named Michael Meisner was at first hidden. Uh, literally, he was disappeared from the face of the earth, was being held in safe houses. and By Scientology. And by Scientology to mm -hmm. keep him out of the hands of the FBI. Mm -hmm. Because after they arrested him, they let him go f before they conducted further questioning and he mm -hmm. disappeared. And then there was an arrest warrant out for him. Long story short, ultimately, Michael Meisner said, I want to turn myself in. I can't take this. Right. And they then kidnapped him and stuck a tennis ball in his mouth. Who, who handcuffed kidnapped him? him? The Guardian's office, the Scientologists. Okay, let's, and, let's talk about, hold on. At this time, the Fair Game Department, who executed these horrific crimes, and acts against people were called the Guardian's Office, and this is a Scientology department dedicated to destroying people. And the head of that department at the time was L. Ron Hubbard's wife, Mary Sue Hubbard. So, and these people who did these things, like Michael, was just called a guardian, right? These were people who were called guardians so that they seem like they're de the defending truth and honor of this amazing organization, Scientology. Boy, that's right out of the, right out of the Guardian <laughs> office PR pack. Yeah, right. So no, that's just that people don't know what the Guardian's office is, and it, and 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 at the time it was just called the GEO. Um, right, and that's what people called it, the GEO, and they these were people who were whatever. Go ahead. Right. So anyway, Michael Meisner eventually went. You know, I'm not doing this anymore. Michael Meisner was kidnapped. He was being held against his will. He eventually sort of acted like everything, he had changed his mind and all was okay until he had an opportunity to escape and he ran away. He managed to escape and he went straight to the FBI. Mm -hmm. That gave the FBI enough direct evidence of mm -hmm. what they were looking for that they got a warrant and that warrant allowed them to go into the Scientology buildings in Los Angeles and Washington, D.C., and take all the files of the Guardian's office. And right. this is what Paulette is alluding to, that that raid on Scientology in 1977 disclosed an enormous amount of information that had otherwise been secret. Now, in these documents that were seized, uh, Scientology and the Guardian's office had everything, because, you know, we keep saying this, but we'll just keep saying it so that the authorities and government agencies understand that everything in Scientology is put in writing. That is a policy, and thank God, everything was put in writing. The operation to destroy people, to infiltrate government agencies, and it was the largest they uncovered that Scientology is responsible for the largest infiltration of government in history. And in these things, Mike, they were, uh, op what was, uh, so they, they call them like Operation Freakout, Operation Snow White, Operation Tucko Less, Operation, what was all of Paulette's operations? The first bomb threat frame up was called Operation Dynamite. Uh -huh. But then they found something series of papers called operation freak out mm -hmm. what had happened was that when they had failed to get me arrested or put into a mental institution those were the two things they were trying to do mm -hmm. they put together something called operation freak out very similar to operation dynamite mm -hmm. this time they would have somebody posing as me 
going around threatening to bomb places, to send letters to people like Henry Kissinger, threatening letters, mm -hmm. in the hopes that I would be arrested. And that's one of the things that they found, including documents that admitted that they had done Operation Dynamite, right. that they had sent the uh, bomb threats. So it was only because of this. Because of the raid. And it was four years mm -hmm. that all I wanted was to prove my innocence because most people, I think, at that point probably thought that I was the one that sent the bomb threats, not the other way around, because Scientology mm -hmm. still had a pretty good reputation. Right. Until right. this, this hurt them very badly. It was all over the world. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know about the, what they had found in the raid. I was coming back from Europe and they used to give out free newspapers on the planes. And I picked up the Washington Post and there was a huge story. Scientology's seized paper indicate writer was framed. Wow. And I just started to cry. I was so happy. Right. When I came home, the Scientologist sued me for the Washington Post. Story. Are you kidding me, Paula? Yeah. No, I didn't even know about it. Anyway. Wow. Uh, yeah, so, exactly. so, so did it end there, Paula? No, no, because I didn't quit. If mm -hmm. I had quit, but the problem is that nobody else was standing up and speaking out against them. Right. And people don't understand that before the internet, it was very difficult to know what was going on. Right. And somebody needed to know. Yeah. And because I had written this book and because I was very open about trying to help people who were having problems, I was constantly hearing from reporters who were doing stories and needed background and from lawyers who were handling lawsuits, their clients were being sued and they needed information. So I became the internet. And right. therefore, yeah, it became even more important as far as Scientology was concerned yeah. to get rid of me and to shut me up. And that was the period in which there were a lot of horrible anonymous smear letters sent about me, besides the first one that I already discussed, mm -hmm. uh, to my adopted parents, um, to the boss of the man that I had planned to marry. The, there, were, uh, there was constant uh, things going on all the time. I used to call it the harassment of the weak. There was always something that they were trying to do. And I really kind of wanted, I wanted to have a normal life. I wanted to get married. I wanted, but nobody else was crazy enough, I guess, to, you know, sort of like, you know, you and Mike, other and, and Tony Ortega. Mm -hmm. We're the ones that are, you know, you're the ones that are really speaking out. And right. I couldn't just abandon all these people. Right. And let Scientology continue With, to destroy their lives. Right. And it's funny because, like like I mentioned before, you guys, it would be all like, uh, at least, but now they continue to do, put up these hate websites now. They yeah. continue yeah. to show up to court appearances mm -hmm. in, in looking like ministers and acting like ministers yeah. and writing smear letters to advertisers. It, you would just think, and, and we keep saying this, it won't ever change because Scientology has policy about policy never changing. Uh, ultimately, the Guardian's office, uh, as a result of that, were 11 Scientologists from the Guardian's office, including Mary Sue Hubbard, were arrested. Right, Mike? And pled guilty, ultimately, to having conducted this campaign of infiltration and smearing people, et cetera, et cetera. But honestly... Even though that was, you know, in the in the history of Scientology, that's probably the worst thing that has ever happened. Right, that, but it wasn't, right? Be, it, but yeah, it yeah, stretched yeah. the surface, Leah. Oh, they, of they, course. What, what, what even, even all of that stuff that they found, the prosecution was of, like, so narrow when mm -hmm. the issue is so broad and so all pervasive mm -hmm. and you know Scientology since 1977 or since actually that 1980 about has sort of tried to push all that into the background and said oh that was just a few rogue people mm -hmm. well the rogue people were 
L. Ron Hubbard's wife right. operating on the policies <laughs> that he wrote, mm -hmm. that those rogue people who we have since gotten rid of, and the way they got rid of them was to replace the Guardian's office with the Office of Special Affairs, but nothing else changed. Right. It so, was it was like the we got rid of fair game by saying we don't use the term anymore because it creates bad public relations. But, but we're we not still, changing what we do. Right. We still do it. <laughs> and now we're going to rebrand the Guardian's office to be called now OSA, which is Office of Special Affairs, which now carries out these activities of fair game today. And you were, yes. you were at one point... Well, the head of this department, Mike, and you well, did your for fair for a long time. Share. I was, yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, but but they say the same point. line. I mean, when you all went on <laughs> CNN saying that you were, you know, you were beaten, you've beaten people on, under the direction of, of Dave Miscavige and L. Ron Hubbard's policies, they're still saying that. No, these people were expelled. These were the bad <laughs> eggs of Scientology. They the <laughs> same routine is going on. Lee is a slut. She just wants to make money. This one's an asshole. That one's a prostitute. That one's a wife beater. That one's a child molester. They're still doing the same thing, the same activities of destroying people, still stalking people, still lying like Paulette said. The things that they've done, the crimes that they have hidden, they are complicit. They are the real criminals. And whatever they accuse people of, is what they've done. If, if the authorities wants to solve these crimes, just listen to what they say and then Ex go, okay. Exactly. And, and, you know, something else I wanted to comment on was, you know, Paulette was saying, well, these law enforcement and the grand jury and whatever, mm -hmm. they have to kind of weigh up and go, well, who do we believe? Do we believe this woman who we're not really sure about. Oh, do we believe these wonderful people over here in mm -hmm. their clerical collars and their crosses? And, mm -hmm. uh, and on top of that, there is also this concept that people, generally good people, do not believe that someone will just out oh. and out lie. Lie. Right. It's very hard to persuade someone that mm -hmm. you see those people over there, what they're saying about me, they just made it up. They just invented this out of absolute whole cloth. They are trying to frame me. And mm -hmm. in in most people's minds, they go, oh, there's a crazy person there. There's a right. crazy person. Mm -hmm. And yet the, the story of Paulette Cooper is the absolute proof mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, also, most people believe that when someone gets caught doing that sort of stuff, they don't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. Like, they learn their lesson. They're not going to come in and try this same routine again. They got caught. They got sent to prison for it. Why would they be doing that all over again? Because oh, it's in I'll the tell policy. You why. <laughs> right. Because it's in the policy. And right. they are going to keep doing it forever. Right. It is not going to change. So right. when we see them coming out and saying Leah Remini is this or Mike Rinder is a wife beater or whoever the current, you know, enemy du jour is, mm -hmm. you can be sure that what they are saying is just as valid as what they said about Paulette Cooper threatening them with a fake bomb threat. It's right. we'll make it up. We'll just invent it. We'll right. and we'll say it, and a lot of people are just going to buy it because right. they don't believe anybody lies like that. Right, right. A series of things happened, including a lawyer starting a class action suit, and all these people who had been afraid to talk, many of them, when they smelled money, were now ready to come out publicly. So right. once I saw that there were p other people who could help those being hurt by Scientology. And Scientology was hurting people. I mean, for me, of course, they, they, they destroyed my life for mm -hmm. so many years, but they destroyed so many people's lives in other ways, bankrupting them, separating them from their family, mm -hmm. practicing fair game if they complained, that I couldn't leave until somebody else was taking over. And this lawyer came in and he took over at which point I was finally able to live a normal life. And as a, as a happy postscript to my life was that somebody, a wonderful man that I had met, 
before all this happened, Mm -hmm. I bumped into again at a party of the lawyer who had handled the end, the settlement with Scientology. So something good came out of it. And I met this man and he's absolutely wonderful. And we've had 32 glorious years together. Right, darling? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) He better just say yes. That, well, partially we joke because he learned to say yes, dear. When Good, he first... perfect. Well trained, <laughs> Paulette. Well trained. <laughs> when we first got married, his best friend said, "Look, you want a happy time? Anything she wants, she's going to get it in the end anyway. So just say yes, dear. <laughs> yes, dear. Right. <laughs> but Paulette, you still continue as you are today, as you have uh, for us on the aftermath, and and you wrote a book with Tony Ortega, so you continue to speak out, continue to do the work. Why is that? Because unfortunately, fair game is still in operation. Mm -hmm. If they had cleaned up their act as they said that they would when Mm -hmm. I actually settled, Mm -hmm. then I would not say a word. But unfortunately, people are still being hurt and uh, they are being harassed if they try to speak out. So I don't make a life out of it anymore like I used to. Uh, But I do occasionally speak out against them when I see that something very bad is happening. Right. And, and we thank you and, and appreciate that, Paula. I mean, what are your thoughts about it? Because you see it every day. I'm sure you see the websites, the hate sites that they put up on people, the lawsuits, the stalking. Yes, very... is, it, is it shocking to you, Paula, that they would continue this so I am many shocked years? That I'm, yeah. I am How shocked you... that I continue to be shocked. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Great, yes. I, I don't yeah. know why I keep expecting something to, different to happen. But, yeah, same. You know, then I, I've even seen a few cases since then where they say, oh, somebody sent them bomb threats. And I say mm-hmm. to myself, oh, sure. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes. And going yes. after people's dogs, you know, I mean, this is something that way back next to my life, I was most afraid for my dog's life because in those days then and now I keep reading somebody who fought Scientology's dog had died. <laughs> You know, Paulette, um, mysteriously, it, we, we talk about that. It's so crazy because, you know, some of the, the victims, their dogs just mysteriously yeah. died. And, you know, you bring that up to a detective and they're like, okay. I'm like, no, no, no. You understand that this is, just, they have a history of doing this. This goes back to the seventies. It's, they have a history of doing, and like Mike said, and like you said, you know, they just look at you like, okay, crazy. Why would a church of Scientology be killing your dog? I mean, that right. just sounds so nuts. <laughs> The, you know, the judge in that uh, government case, mm-hmm. his dog mysteriously died. So we're talking now back early in the 70s. Oh, yes. Yeah. They, they use the same techniques. People are still, you know, being smeared. Yes. It's really, it's very sad because they right. hurt themselves. They don't realize it. Well, the- yeah. But the, like I said, you know, Scientology is a policy of policy not changing. And so I just hope that one day that, con- you know, w- which is why we're doing this podcast, Paulette, as opposed to doing something else that we just wanted to dedicate something to talking just about fair game, because it just seems like it's just not enough that people just don't understand that this goes on every day as it has been for decades since the policy was written. And the behavior for a church is absolutely abhorrent. Yes. Agreed. So hopefully with our continued discussion and exposing what they're doing, what they have done, what they're doing presently, we can bring an end to this like this year. (laughs) (laughs) Because I too would like to move on. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I know the feeling, believe yes, me. After, yes, I know. After, after 50 years, there's other very bad things in the world, too, that deserve our attention and help. Agreed. Agreed. Well, thank oh. you, Paulette. I, I cannot thank you enough, and I thank you for your your courage. And we're we're just lucky to have someone like you in the world who was willing to fight for this long, and you persevered, and thank you. Well, thank you for all that you and Mike and a plug for Tony Ortega and of his course. daily blog. What a difference that makes that every day, exactly. something bad that Scientology does, he exposes. Agreed. He's been actually between the three of you. I'm not needed anymore. And that's the best. Oh, part. that's not true, Paulette. <laughs> <laughs> Don't uh, think you're on vacation, uh, my friend. Oh my 
<laughs> husband just laughed when he heard that. Yeah, because he knows, <laughs> yes, dear. <laughs> yes, dear. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you again, Paul. Thank you Paulette. so much, yes. Paulette. Yes, thank you. Okay. And God bless you guys. <laughs>